Um, okay, well, thank you everyone for joining our virtual Lunch and Learn. It is Friday, August 21st. Um, and we are very excited to be sharing the results of the update to our 2020 sector snapshot. A um, lot has changed since April. Um, it seems like a million years ago. Um, and we've got some, some new data, some new insights, insights to share, and we've brought a good chunk of the CNM team here to um, share them with you all. Um, so before we dive in, just wanted to go over some of our normal housekeeping, make sure that everybody knows some of the resources that we have available for all of you. A um, couple of things I wanted to highlight. One is our consulting team has been doing um, free open office hours appointments. So if you have a burning question, need an expert to talk to, somebody beyond just you know Googling your, your search there, um, we've got experts that are standing by and ready to chat with you. Um, you can schedule those appointments from our homepage. Um, we just finished our Summer of Change virtual seminar series um, that was a very big success. Um, got a lot of great feedback and covered a lot of cool new topics and are in the process of launching our um, fall calendar pretty soon. So a bunch of new courses will be coming online in the next week or two. Um, as well as our COVID resource page, we're continuing to update, continuing to add resources as those are made available. A um, couple opportunities I wanted to highlight in the next um, few weeks coming up. Um, next week on Wednesday, um, Regina is going to be leading a CEO Confidential just summer coffee break series. Um, this is designed specifically for executive directors, um, leaders, co-founders, that sort of thing. Um, you guys are under unique types of pressure and creating a little safe space where you guys can chat together and share some coffee. Um, and then we've got a couple of new seminars that will be starting in mid-September, and those are kicking off our fall series. Um, the first one of those is creating a budget narrative, um, and then our smash hit that we offer pretty regularly, Advanced Supervising for Success. Um, so you can check those all out on our website um, at cnmsocal.org slash events. Um, last up before we dive into this um, snapshot is just a couple of housekeeping for um, our virtual lunch and learn sessions. Wanted to make it clear that this session is being recorded. Um, we put these up on our YouTube channel so that people who are unable to attend are able to view them later. Um, but, you know, in general, please just, you know, keep yourself muted when you're not speaking. Um, we'd love to see your faces, but video is not required. Um, we will be doing some breakout rooms um, halfway through after we've presented all the data. We really want to hear, um, you know, what if it rings true to you? How has it been reflective of your experience? And if there are things that were not captured in our report that, um, you know, you'd like to add. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Regina, who is going to um, or sorry, to Christine, who's going to get us started, um, and then we'll change hands a couple times here. So take us away. All right. Thank you so much, Erin. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Lunch and Learn. Um, today we'll be talking through um, the updated information that we gathered through our snapshot survey, um, as well as some of the other information that we've collected through all of our engagements with your organizations, um, and other networks that we'll be talking about today. So, as many of you may know, about 350 organizations completed our sector snapshot survey in April and May. And we thought that it, because things are shifting so fast in the environment, we wanted to check in with you again and see what additional information we could collect that might be helpful um, as you're making decisions and navigating this very turbulent and um, quickly changing time. So about 150 organizations participated in our more recent summer update survey, and we'll be looking at the results of that survey today. Um, the majority of these organizations are located in Los Angeles County, but they really represented um, a vast array of fields of service and also organizational size. Some of the information that we'll be looking at today um, is comparing two groups, very small nonprofit organizations and very large nonprofit organizations. And just keep in mind that for the most part, the small organizations that we're looking at were largely arts and youth services organizations. And those large organizations we were looking at are, um, were largely social service and mental health organizations. To sort of set the stage, you all are probably very familiar with this already, but we thought this was a pretty dramatic representation of 
the reality that we're all collectively facing right now. Um, these are two maps um, by census tract of Los Angeles. As you see, one is February and one is June. And the depth of color, the closer it gets to black, the closer it gets to a 30% unemployment rate. And so you can see looking at these maps, um, how currently unemployment is mapping across our county. Um, and it's just been a dramatic shift and a very quick shift. And the unemployment is really concentrated um, in this Northeast San Fernando Valley, Metro Los Angeles, and down into South Los Angeles in the South Bay. And setting this context is important because one of the things that we asked all of you to tell us about, and this is in the survey, but also conversations that we've been having with all of you is, how have you shifted programs to respond to immediate community needs? And um, as we'll see in the next slide, we just created um, a word cloud of what came up most frequently. And you see the word food, <laughs> that was definitely mentioned the most. So just to sort of set the stage, you know, we're all working hard to respond to our immediate community needs. And um, things like food were one of the most immediate needs that many of us had to reshuffle um, our programs to be able to address. And you also see virtual, we've all moved to these virtual platforms and that's definitely impacting um, our organizations and our programming. So today we'll talk through four different themes that um, we identified in both the snapshot and again in all of our engagements um, with organizations throughout Los Angeles County. And those themes include the financial trends, ways in which organizations are adapting programs, services, and operations, um, returning to the office and what that looks like, and then the response to calls for equity. So I'll hand it off to Mara Harrington um, for a little audience poll. Yes, well, um, before we dive deeper in into the data, we uh, have a couple polls that will just take a moment. We'd like you to consider and answer pretty quickly. Um, you know, what have, what have been your organization's biggest challenge, your, the biggest challenge since April? So um, thank you, Erin, for queuing the poll. If folks could just take a moment and we can look at this. Ready, able to vote. Not seeing any votes coming in. Want to make sure there's nothing broken on our end. <laughs> uh, votes are coming in. I can see them, Aaron, on my screen. Oh, interesting. I don't know if uh, yeah. <laughs> Zoom <laughs> fun. Uh, right now we're at 20 of 33, 21. So we'll give it another couple seconds. Awesome. All right, the last of you. Interesting. Do you want to end and share the poll? I want to make sure I don't break anything on my end. Yeah, let me see. Still got a couple more coming in, it looks like. And we're just doing the first question now. So just be it's between the first eight question for now, yeah. So let me let me stop there. We do have um, you know, uh, about 70% of folks. Okay, a couple more just came in. I was really surprised that one thing I'll tell you in a moment. So um, when I end polling, Erin, uh, it may be able to maybe that you can share it, or do I need to share see, share results? Did that work? Okay, so when I mentioned I was a little surprised, up until the last couple of votes, there was uh, no one who brought up staff reductions. But we see here that, um, you know, the one that kind of is the leading one is the changing programs and operations, which is consistent with what we've seen, uh, and then fundraising and working remotely. So, uh, very good. Okay, so Aaron, do you want to launch the second question and then we'll, we'll keep moving on? All right, okay, second question. You. Perfect. Yeah, same answers, but looking forward between now and the end of the year. Oh, coming in fast now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know when we're at good critical mass and you want to share, because for we're whatever reason, I'm there. not seeing anything coming in. <laughs> we're getting there. Thank you all for being quick, quick learners. You're faster this time.
All right, one more second. And uh, all right, we have a, a good critical mass. Let me end the polling and share. So here we see 65% uh, with fundraising, followed by responding to calls for equity and changing programs and operations and a bit about working remotely. So thank you all. And I think this is, we're gonna see some consistent things. So I'm gonna stop the share and give it back to you. Okay, Regina. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I didn't wanna make noise before, sorry about that. Um, so hi everybody, good to see you. We know that it's been a crazy summer, so we wanted to just take a pause for a moment and share what we were seeing. But we also really want to hear from you about is this sounding like your life right now? And um, so urge you to put things in the chat. There's going to be a chance to talk with peers in a little bit and some of our consultants. Um, so want to share that. Um, the, as Christine had mentioned, that this has really been the perfect storm, you know, between COVID and um, trying to keep your employees safe and moving home and um, clients safe and dealing with the economic uncertainty and then the uprising. You've had plenty to deal with and we know for leaders that this has been you know, a series of stressors. Um, what we were um, trying to find out with this quick snapshot was, you know, what are you seeing that's, um, you know, after the kind of original reaction and response, what are you seeing um, sort of going forward? So a couple of things that CNM did um, over the last several months, and you guys have been part of this, I, over 7,500 people have participated in our lunch and learns, our webinars, um, um, we see a few of you every Friday and we're really excited that um, it feels like we see friends on Fridays to take a break and think together. Um, so lots of interest and there's some upcoming um, sessions in fact on PPP um, scenario planning, um, all the issues around HR. Um, we know that boards are, you know, making hard decisions that they probably weren't planning to make in January and February. So. Um, for those of you that participated in the 501 conference, you know that that was right as the uprising was really taking hold and um, lots of important opportunities to work together on issues that have been going on in our community for decades. And then um, lastly, um, in addition to all the seminars and the consulting projects, um, something that we really wanna keep you guys engaged in, which is um, the county had asked about economic resiliency and um, um, we're working with a group of leaders at, um, across the region um, and we want to hear from you. Um, we are taking this moment to talk to the county, the board of supervisors, the department heads, the CEO's office about contracting, about reimbursement, about those hubs in our community that are not getting the resources that they need that are largely black and brown. Um, that have been impacted most by, you know, the sort of hourly wages, that means job loss, that means renters that are now, you know, at a risk of eviction and high um, um, risk for COVID and lack of healthcare. So um, we're going to be assembling focus groups um, and really want to hear from you because we want to make sure that wherever, whatever we recommend to the county is relevant to the work that you're doing. But Enough about that. You guys actually wanted to hear about the sector snapshot. So um, just wanna let you know that like you, this has been a crazy time and philanthropy, both, both government, um, private foundations and um, uh, corporate uh, social responsibility has all been struggling to figure out how to respond to this extraordinary moment. So um, proudly in LA County, um, the world of philanthropy um, assembled over 150, 100, it's, over, it's about 120 at this point, million dollars that largely um, came together in about 60 days to respond to all the needs that were emerging, mostly hunger. Um, uh, it just happened so quickly and a lot of money for some of you, you saw that there were dollars available. For others of you, that meant that if you weren't providing essential services, you really had to just wait and take a pause. 
Um, the other sort of, you know, in the sort of silver lining category, you know, all of the colleagues around philanthropy, government, and corporate social responsibility are finding that some of the flexibility that they tried out um, during this initial phase um, ended up being strategies that they're going to continue for a while. Um, this idea of converting grants and contracts a little bit more to general operating support, loosening up on deadlines, some of the scope of work could change. Um, if you could make the case that you were responding to a need that's, you know, kind of surfaced um, over the last couple months. So um, more flexibility, more trust. Um, that's not to say that we're not still accountable. We absolutely are. Um, it just means that everybody is asking questions and nobody's sure um, what the right answer is. So um, there was that moment where it was rapid response. What we're really seeing is um, a bit of a pause and a reorganizing and regrouping as people are looking at um, their giving going forward and then into 2021. So I'm sure um, you've heard from us and probably from your colleagues, you know, this is a good time to talk to your funders, to whatever that funding source is. Um, things are negotiable in many, many cases, but you won't ask if you, you won't get if you don't ask. So next slide is um, starting to get into some of the trends that um, emerged pretty quickly. Um, in March, you know, it, it feels like such a long time ago, but to Christine's point, what we really wanted to find out is what was happening with large and small, because we weren't sure who was going to be able to be most nimble, who was gonna be most impacted. So um, the revenue streams on the sort of, it, I keep thinking this is not gonna be hugely surprising to you guys, but um, two things dried up pretty quickly and we had to regroup, right? The fund development sort of hit because we couldn't do events. And then so many of you had positioned a fee for service and suddenly we couldn't do those services the, way, the same way. So um, individual donor uh, revenue dropped in some cases. Um, and then in other cases, what we saw was um, if you were making the case, you know, for the food banks, for example, because everyone understood hunger um, was becoming an issue as people lost their jobs. Um, some of those um, centers really saw growth. And um, uh, the other thing that we saw on the financial side was that we were getting a lot of questions about what they could do um, virtually. Um, is it sounding tone deaf if I'm trying to raise money when there's others that are in a much more dire situation right now? There was just a lot of strife in the questions that you were all asking about. Is it okay if we keep talking about our cause when there's others that need so much more? So um, um, by August, um, Basically, what we know is that um, there's been some extreme disruption for small groups, um, that there's been moderate dis disruption for um, large groups. But even with that, what we know is it, <laughs> disruption is a broad topic. So if we go to, um, Sorry, you're probably trying to keep up with me, Aaron, and I'm making it hard. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, large and small groups and what's happening in terms of um, revenue. So uh, if you think about the spring, there was a lot of activity and a lot of optimism around PPP -P 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 and PPE. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, some of the organizations and, that uh, were excited about going after those government dollars that were essentially going to become forgivable loans um, if we could meet the terms and conditions. Um, so for larger organizations, um, they had um, a kind of more access to PPP. For smaller organizations, um, you know, we've talked about this a bit, but just in case, um, some issues for smaller organizations who didn't have access to um, a good relationship with a bank or a lender. Um, but I was surprised to see how many um, received PPP loans. So it was interesting to me that 67% um, uh, of you, large, 62 small, um, said you applied. 
um, that uh, most likely if you received the loan or didn't receive the loan, it was it became a timing issue once they figured out that it couldn't just go to the biggest uh, organizations, which was kind of phase two, um, then it just became where you were in the queue. So let's go to the next slide. Um, uh, also, just sort of talking about PPP, I had mentioned before, um, for those of you that did get the loan, we know that there is a huge uh, amount of confusion because the federal government's been really slow to send down the, um, the guidance. And so we're working with um, the nonprofit finance fund. We have been for months now to make sure that you have access to the information on how to do some of the next uh, sort of documentation and reporting that's coming up to comply. So to sort of untangle some of that confusion. Um, many of the sessions that we've scheduled have sold out. So we're gonna do our best to just keep offering them. Um, just know help is on the way. Um, and you're not alone if you're getting a headache over that. Um, you're, every accountant <laughs> I've talked to lately shares your pain um, and many, many banks as well. So um, speaking of adapting um, programs and services, um, so again, just the, the extraordinary response from our sector, what I heard over and over again was that need was going up and that if somebody showed up at your door, you were gonna respond. So there was some mission creep that historically we would say isn't a good thing. But right now what we heard from so many leaders was that need just exploded. And when you think about that map that Christine showed, not surprising when people lose their jobs um, and with the virus and safety concerns, there was just so much happening. And what I heard from an awful lot of leaders was, we're just gonna do what it takes and we're gonna figure it out later. Later's coming, because what we know is that that's not a sustainable model and that we're seeing more and more um, organizations now saying, okay, we've got to kind of regroup, figure out what's sustainable. Um, so need increased significantly. And then um, talking about um, service needs, part of this, I'm guessing total speculation, um, what we saw with some of the smaller groups is that, and what we heard from all of you throughout the summer was that about 50% of you said you just stopped offering some services because you couldn't afford to do it. In other cases, nothing changed. You were just trying to survive and figure it out. What we heard from some organizations was we can get through 2020 without much change. Um, and then we're really a little, not a little, but a lot nervous about 2021 and 22. So some people tap preserves. Some people felt like they were in a pretty good position, um, but looking ahead really hard to, to figure out what to do. So um, going to um, cutting program services budget, you can sort of see how that's playing out. Um, the reduced staff hours, you know, in the beginning, um, what we heard from a lot of people is that one quick response, both large and small, was to um, take advantage of some of the programs through unemployment to furlough people um, so that you could take a pause, reduce your costs and figure it out and they wouldn't have to take really a pay cut. Um, so there was a lot of adjusting going on. Um, there were some layoffs, as you'll see, 27% of the large, 17% uh, of the small, but, or 14%, sorry. But um, you know what we saw, it was, it was kind of shifting sand you know, some organizations could not stop delivering services in the field. Some people could um, shut down a program and take a pause because it couldn't be done remotely. Um, some organizations just said the money isn't gonna work if there aren't fees to be um, uh, uh, charged for services. And um, even with contracts, if you can't deliver a service, you couldn't get reimbursed for it. So. Um, about 20% of you kind of on average told us last spring that you were shutting down. Um, we're hoping that um, some of the strategies that we've been talking about all summer about looking at what assets you have in the community and um, partnerships where you may, so we don't lose all that intellectual capital, it's gonna be really important over the next 12 to 24 months. So um, it's not you, it's the environment that's making a lot of these choices really hard for people. 
So as we think about um, adapting programs, um, you told us that um, uh, there was the issue of responding to community need. And what I really believe is there was kind of a sobering that happened over the spring and summer where we thought it was short term, it's getting longer term. And um, what we heard from a lot of you is that, you know, there was some optimism in the spring that now is becoming, no, these are choices that we're just gonna have to make. So um, in terms of May versus August, thinking about um, some of that optimism where there were some changes and then there was some, you know, absolute recognition that the need just keeps growing and there's no sign of letting up. Um, there was also so much confusion that you guys talked about coming between the messages that we were getting from uh, the sort of political leaders and the health leaders about, you know, a lot of stops and starts and try to keep up with that and just all the confusion and what that meant to sort of get ready to gear up and then never mind um, get the money for um, any of the equipment that you needed. Um, meant that that was a, a budget item that you hadn't planned on. Um, there was a lot that was going on in terms of how to cut programs, how to deal with budgets, how to uh, respond to service capacity. Um, and then last, um, the shutting down. Um, that, you know, what we know is that about 20% of you have said that that was gonna happen. About 17% of you right now saying that that's being considered. Before we move on, Regina, there are a couple of questions. Um, Christine, I'm curious, another Christine asked um, about the data for organizations kind of in the middle, the five to 49 full-time employees. Curious if you want to speak to um, kind of the sample size we got and, you know, the data that you were able to pull from. You know, Christine's going to be the best resource on some of that and maybe Christine and Christine, um, I know that there's a lot of questions probably because most of our market is in the middle. We're sort of struck by where the trends were landing with small and large. Um, Christine, is there anything on our end that you want to add? In general, the middle fell in the middle. Um, but if there are any of these particular topics that you'd like me to look into more deeply, I'm super happy to connect with any of you individually. And um, we can look at what we heard with more specificity. But the, the small organizations and the large organizations really represent the extremes of what we saw in these trends. Yeah. Um, and also, David Saul had raised your hand. Uh, David, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? For a second. If not, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll get back to it. Um, in general, just please leave questions in the chat and we'll try and you know, address them when we're able to. Um, all right, Regina, I'll let you keep going then for now. Thanks. You know, to Christine's point and for all of you guys that are putting notes in the chat, um, you know, this is not a one size fits all moment. And um, the thing that makes this all so interesting for us is that um, when we even talk about just returning to work, look at what you see, you know, that some people are thinking um, that it's within six months. Some of it is will make modifications and um, some of you never left. Some of you said it's too hard to predict. Um, some of you have told us that you've learned some things about working remotely that have worked really well for your clients and worked really well for your um, staff. So um, it's kind of, um, I was talking to a group of people yesterday, the good news and the bad news is kind of, it's the wild west right now. That there's opportunities for ideas, for innovation, and um, so some of those silver linings that we talk about on the moving back to home, uh, um, people learned the where technology could help. Um, uh, sometimes there were efficiencies, sometimes there were savings, sometimes there was growth um, where you could reach a bigger audience. Um, uh, that there were new ways to reach clients that had a better response. Um, when they didn't have to get on a freeway or deal with traffic and parking where they could call you and um, get the information that they needed or the service and help that they needed. Um, and that uh, definitely on the organizational side, we heard so many of you talking about how do I manage people remotely when I don't see them? 
you know, how can I keep up morale in the midst of all this stress? Um, how do we keep people engaged and on a team? And um, just know that everyone is tired of Zoom. Um, from colleagues around the world, I can tell you, leaders are tired of the Zoom screens. And also, um, there's no getting around the fact for leaders that you're just going to have to put a lot more effort at the management and supervisory level in communication, in understanding that people are afraid that the, the virus is present in everyone's lives. Um, and that um, we have to factor all that in as people are trying to return to school, people are worried about family members. Um, there's just a lot that's being juggled in our sector and in our workforce. Um, and for leaders, that just means over communicating and taking a pause and finding some ways to have some fun now and again as a group. Um, we've been entertained by all of the fun solutions that you've all been coming up with to make sure that people um, uh, feel recognized and uh, part of the team. So on the calls for equity, um, you know, we know that this is an important opportunity to um, talk about um, feelings and facts and trends and ways that organizations can respond um, and ways that staff can respond and be thinking about how we can work better together um, around common purpose. So um, two thirds of you um, said that you are undergoing an assessment on your organizational culture. Two thirds said that you are looking at your programs and services through that sort of equity and inclusion lens. Um, half of you are talking about your hiring practices. I know that many, many boards are talking to us about what that means in the world of board governance. So um, it's a, definitely a hot topic with um, lots of complicated answers, but really excited to say that, you know, two thirds of you are involved in this. So curious, I'm seeing lots of things show up in the chat. So um, I don't know if we wanna take a minute. Um, between all, we have a few consultants on the, uh, as part of this conversation right now. Um, what I think I want to do is go to the breakout rooms. We'd like to give you guys a chance to talk to each other about, you know, does this sound right to you? Um, are there different experiences that you're having? Are there issues that you see emerging that we haven't covered yet that we should keep an eye on? So what we thought is we'd like you, um, number one, to take advantage of a few minutes to talk to some of your peers about what's going on with you, what's keeping you up at night, um, you know, the amazing thing with these uh, gatherings is that many, many of your peers are feeling it too and have tried things that you can borrow. And we have a very generous sector that likes to share ideas. So we want to give you about 15 minutes to talk among yourselves, introduce yourselves, um, and talk about what's happening um, with your finances, with your programs, how you're handling returning to work, what's happening around those discussions around equity and inclusion. Um, and then it, what you've done to adapt, you know, and then when we come back, we want to share some of the things that are challenges for you and what are some of the things that are working. So we look forward to hearing from you in 15 minutes. Um, our team, I think, will be popping in and out. If we can help, we're happy to help. And uh, we'll see you soon. Aaron, did I leave anything out? Nope, that was it. Um, I'm getting ready to click the button. We'll have some CNM staffers um, in some of these rooms already, but not all of them because we got to bunch of you guys here today. So um, as, as Regina mentioned, people will be popping out and going between different rooms, but um, otherwise we'll see everyone all back here in 15 minutes. Some of that mission creep to just respond to whatever it takes right now. Also the idea of how to help new employees and longtime employees integrate. Um, Shannon and Shannon, you guys want to talk a little bit about sort of what some of the things that are are bubbling up as you think ahead to what you're going to be doing next? Sure. I'm brand new at my organization. Um, and uh, I, I think before COVID, there wasn't a huge remote working culture. Like I think it happened sometimes, but it wasn't the norm for the organization. So I'm trying to figure out my job and learn my job and at the same time get to know my team. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm looking at trying to set up uh, virtual lunches, just have a video lunch with me. But, you know, besides getting the work done, it's, it's building those personal relationships uh, internally that I think is uh, perhaps the biggest struggle for me. And hi, this is Shannon Nelson, the other Shannon that was in the uh, room. Um, you know, the majority of the 80 employees, uh, you know, we initially all went remote as much as we could for a nonprofit housing developer at a community of friends. So we still had to build housing and get people off the street and get them in their homes. And that work has continued. But, you know, we went into this mode of becoming sort of a food bank for the first two months of the, of the Safer at Home shutdown. And, um, and then, you know, planning a gala and, and not being able to have it, but, but those generous donors did let the money carry over. But we talked about now what does individual donations and fund development look like between now and, and the end of the year? And, and even what, like, what will those creative things look like as we continue to uh, make sure that our donors know that we, we still need them and we're still doing our work. Um, but at the same time, like the other Shannon said, staying engaged with staff and um, trying to have a lunch or check in with one another. We're all probably dealing with the Zoom fatigue and, and just what does the work look like um, moving forward um, internally and externally. Absolutely. Some, some familiar trends there. And I was curious, uh, um, one of my coworkers, Alicia, is on here as well. And she joined CNM remotely after we had all you know, gone into lockdown. And I have still yet to meet her in person. Uh, but we've worked together and worked together a lot very closely. Curious, Elisa, if you want to chime in with any, um, you know, advice on joining an organization remotely, anything that you've learned, not to put you on the spot or anything. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, definitely was different. I've never um, onboarded virtually in the midst of a pandemic um, in a civil <laughs> So Hopefully that it's, won't ever um, happen never have again. before? Yeah. <laughs> no, never done that before. But I think it's just being, you know, I mean, first of all, gratitude in terms of being able to to be able to have a job in this in the current state that we're in, and also a job that does allow me the privilege to be able to work from home, because I know not everybody is in that position. So I think it's that, and I think like really being kind to yourself, because I know for me it's like I want to get things a lot quicker, and I I feel like I should be in a different place already, and understanding that it's going to take some time to learn cultures is learn usually when you interact with people in person and not you know over Zoom or over phone. Um, so, you know, trying to be as, as kind to yourself as possible and to others because others are also going through, you know, their own personal situations with family, friends, uh, and, and their workloads. So I think it's really um, being mindful of that and giving people the space to kind of, you know, take the breaks when they need those breaks, um, you know, especially from Zoom because there can be a bit of a, a Zoom overload, I think, at times. Um, and I think trust, you know, just trusting in staff, trusting in, in um management as well that um, people have each other's best interests at heart and you know really being able to have the have conversations about that you know if something's coming up being being feeling like you can have a conversation about it um, so those are just kind of the things that I've thought about in my time since March also the zoom backdrops Alicia is like the queen of zoom backdrops so really making the virtual situation work um, Mara, curious in, in your group, any, any themes emerge, any uh, things that really lined up with or did not line up with the results of the snapshot? Uh, sure. I joined my group a, a little late. I popped in. Um, Seth and um, Peggy, I think you probably have a few things to say, but we're, we, I think one thing I really walked away with was um, the, the need now more than ever to be able to secure general operating funds. Um, to be able to uh, work on salaries and to be able to to expand and grow. So I don't know, Seth, if you want to draw or Peg, I'm trying to see where you. Um, yeah, I'm on the uh, I'm, I'm board chair for All People's Community Center in South LA, and um, yeah, we're doing fine um, because we provide essential services, and our ED has been doing her job for 37 years. So basically. Um, I'm chief drum beater. Um, the, the good news is Sandra Bryant's amazing. The bad news is that she's going to retire in three years. And we get a lot of restricted money, but getting unrestricted money to bring her salary up to something that I'm not ashamed to talk about and recruit a decent, you know, a, a worthy successor is uh, really um, the first 27 priorities for my job. 
Um, and then a secondary thing would be once we do secure another ED, uh, there should be a development director so that um, the ED can um, be an ED and not have to be begging for money all the time. So I guess my question was um, all to do with the ability to go to uh, foundations that do like us um, and say, hey, what I really need money is for uh, an existential issue, um, unrestricted money to secure the continued legacy of an organization that frankly does uh, $10 million worth of work a year for $2 million in uh, a budget. Um, you know, um, do you want us around or not? And I was just uh, appreciating some of your remarks, Regina. We are in uh, the arts, so we're in a non-essential sector, non-essential. Of course, we in the arts feel that arts are essential, of course, um, but not wanting to be tone deaf and continue to create robust programs and outreach at this time and really looking at the um, equity and inclusion and, and all of that. So this idea of these cross currents of this storm is really uh, speaking to where we're living right now. Um, the Lineage Performing Arts Center is a brand new building in Pasadena, between Pasadena and Altadena, and we haven't been able to open our doors. So we actually had a big capital campaign and built a brand new performing arts center above the freeway in a, in a sector of Pasadena that's very underserved. And we haven't been able to do one program in person. So someday soon, we hope to, but the virtual programming continues. And to Seth's point, just having that unrestricted funding to create that cushion uh, is you know, something that we're continuing to look at. Gotcha. I'm, for all of you that are arts organizations, you know, there is an appreciation that you guys were kind of at the back of the line in this past few months, but there's lots coming. So you should feel good about there's a real appreciation for the role that the funders and government is looking at some money that you should be hearing about pretty quickly um, to help with some of that. I mean, really quickly. I'm really excited to tell you as we end this week that they've heard you and that they appreciate that part of getting this community back whole is going to need that feeding the soul and having those outlets and um and not letting all of you flounder so there there's help is on the way on that one um some thank really you. big influential people are making some things happen awesome thank you keep an, keep an eye out and we'll keep you posted excellent um, I'm realizing that we're at the end of our time here. We could definitely stay. I want to, you know, hear more about what was discussed in the breakout rooms. But if you got to hop off, if you got another meeting, completely understand. Um, really thank everyone for joining us today and hope that this was an informative session. Um, but yeah, would love to hear more about other breakout rooms. Um, feel free to raise your hand, unmute yourself if you have anything you want to share. Um, Christine, I'm curious. You're the person who's been, you know, closest to this data. What what your conversations were like in that breakout room? Uh, we actually we talked about something a little bit different from um, the themes that came out of the snapshot, which is sort of the how demanding this period of time has been on individuals, and then when individuals go to work, and um, depending on the kind of work they do in their nonprofit organizations, the degree to which that work can also be somewhat taxing. Um, so, for example. Um, one of our group participants shared a story. One of the senior level staff in his organization is a parent and has been balancing a lot of stressors in their personal life um, in addition to the stressors at work. And at some point, it's just feeling like um, it's too much, which is a totally human thing to feel. And someone else talked about in a lot of the organizations that they partner with, um, the staff are experiencing those things and then coming to work and experiencing secondary trauma because they're working very, very closely with families who are also all feeling those stressors very intensely. Um, and so it's really, it's very, this is a very demanding time for our field and requires that some extra care be put in to make sure that um, our staff are well taken care of so that they have the energy available to continue to stay very committed um, to the work that they're doing. And it yeah. seems to be getting harder the longer this goes on. 
Yeah, and I was going to say you wouldn't understand anything about, you know, balancing childcare needs and family needs while working and all of that. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that brings up a good point, though, and something that we had been kind of curious to try and tease out of the data in this snapshot is, you know, why are some organizations succeeding and others not? You know, it's, it's hard to find this clear cut pattern of, you know, if you do X, Y, Z, you'll be fine. But there seem to be so many different forces at play that make that a really hard formula to nail down. And that one of those key, like hardest to quantify is that, you know, individual and just like team resilience and adaptability. I'm curious if anyone has any, you know, anecdotal information to share from, from your groups about, you know, how your team has been adapting quickly, how you've been pivoting, how the organization has been pivoting. Um, um, anything to share on that front? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I'm the founder and chairman of a nonprofit organization called Best Planet Foundation. And initially our, our, entire goal was to house homeless youth, teach them, educate them, and then find medical care for them. And we were searching under LIHTC, low income housing, the, the low income housing tax credit, and the pandemic came. And because a lot of my friends are from Los Angeles and, you know, some of them are in the entertainment field, well, a lot of them got us some really cool uh, energy and so now we have access to over six million coronavirus test kits so um, the rapid ones so that brought a lot of energy financially to our organization um, that wouldn't have come if it weren't for the pandemic so now we're just shopping around with you know maybe the Los Angeles County Health Department or if UCLA Medical needs some or you know, we're just searching for these huge contracts because this right now would help our business rise. And then we could get right back to, you know, now we're going to try to renovate a hospital or renovate a building over there on six and San Pedro and turn it into a, a mental health care facility with the funding and the money that we get from, you know, selling these test kits. So uh, I, I think that it takes, um, it takes a, owner or leader and you know followers um to all be on the same page that the only way that you can help is to be financially stable it's there's a difference between helping a lot and expecting a little than gathering a whole bunch of everything and then helping as much as you possibly can i mean you cannot help expansively if you don't expand yourself financially, uh, spiritually, emotionally. I mean, everything needs to be fully expanded in your own life and business and company in order for you to be able to expand your knowledge and wealth amongst the masses. So that, that's been our antidote and we just started. So, you know, we're just moving full fledged until, you know, until we can't. Very cool. Thanks for sharing. Um, Aaron, yeah, Ellen. Can I jump in? Um, yeah. Two things. In response to your question about how we've changed our business, we, we're a very large nonprofit uh, in northern Los Angeles County and all of San Bernardino County. We have close to a thousand staff and do lots of different businesses. And our staff have always felt a little disconnected, but because of COVID, every supervisor speaks to every one of their staff for at least five minutes every day. Every manager has a meeting of all their teams at least once a week. And we just did a pulse survey that said the communication, like 80% said the communication's been wonderful. They feel so connected to their teams. And because we're cross counties, it's really hard to physically see each other on a regular basis. It's a two hour drive from one, one of our offices to another. And so it's much to our surprise, brought people a lot closer. That's just one of our unexpected things. From the business point of view, we are childcare business primarily, so we've gotten more money than we ever expected and feel really blessed, um, but we're worried about a future recession. On the other end of that, we have almost 3,000 kids in Head Start, and we have been not been able to open our program because of the liability issues, and if you as a nonprofit organization could help with that, we just cannot, we have no coverage for COVID-related illness. If a child got sick and we got sued, we'd be out of business. 
even as big as we are. We cannot open our childcare centers without liability. And I know LAUSD suffers the same thing. And um, it's a huge issue for any nonprofit moving forward that serves people face to face is the liability. So that's one big issue I wanted to lift up. And the other really is now that we went within a week, 800 people were working remotely and we want to keep about 20% of those people because they're doing a phenomenal job working remotely out there in, in, in the field, so to speak. And we don't know anything about how to manage remote anything. So we're looking up articles online and we're trying to figure it out, but we just don't know how to do performance online, you know, remotely and check on the metrics remotely and, and all that kind of stuff. So I would recommend that as a future conversation. Hmm. Thank you. Ellen, I can just tell you those, both those topics, you're not alone. Um, we have been talking to the county a lot about liability issues and um, it's a tricky one, but people are thinking and talking about it. So, um, and this whole idea under the HR umbrella, everything about managing and supervising and holding people accountable and trying to listen to Christine's point about some of the stressors and trying to balance all of that. There's just a, you know, the message really is just keep over communicating, you know, with your team um, and not assuming that you've covered it. And then Seth, to your point, I think too, it's kind of where the board can play a role in asking questions about how everybody's doing um, and where you can be a spokesperson with philanthropy around um, some of your future plans. Um, you know, they're listening to what people are saying on the streets right now um, and then open as best they can um, to try and take that message up to their boards. So um, this is a good time to, um, you know, think about what, um, you know, I know for many boards that we were talking to the last couple of weeks, just having the, the board ask the question of the ED, how are people doing is huge you know, because it also kind of signals to the ED that you're allowed to admit that, you know, all across our nation, people are depressed over a variety of things and trying to get their job done. And, you know, we did have the Department of Mental Health on one session say the first thing is just ask the question and talk about it um, is a good stress reliever. So just to sort of normalize that, you know, there's just an awful lot of stressors and people are doing their best to try and serve others. and. Um, that we're in this together. Well, we didn't have to write a thousand letters, but uh, the, the board, we all wrote personal letters to the uh, 36 full-time employees and the, they very much appreciated it. Yeah, that's great. And then we make a point of highlighting them in the, in the, in the newsletters. Um, you know, it, it means a lot. Mm -hmm. It does, good job. Yeah, there was a good question in the chat too from uh, Genevieve about asking for some suggestions on self-care and connection practices, you know, how to create some opportunities for your staff that feel like they would be, you know, appealing and healing without making a chore of like, oh, now we've got to do, you know, this event too. Um, and curious if there are any suggestions from the group. One that I've seen um, that I, I think is an interesting option is a meeting free day. Um, everyone's been very stressed out by, you know, over communication and, you know, how to allocate your time differently. And I've seen organizations just agree like no meetings on Thursdays, you know, we'll have meetings other days, but that'll be your heads down work day. Um, and Alicia here mentioned that um, she's seen some orgs using uh, meditation techniques, bringing someone in to do a session on Zoom um, or connecting to staff appointments um, around self-care. I'm curious if anyone else has any other suggestions to add. Peggy mentioned that's, that's one of her areas, mindfulness and meditation. Um, and Christine here just shared a great link to LA County uh, Department of Mental Health. They're doing um, free self-care. Um, so that's definitely something to check out. Oh yeah, through Headspace. Um, I checked that out. Um, Headspace is a great meditation app um, that has been made free for anyone in LA County and you just verify with your address. Um, yep. uh, yeah, Peggy. Yeah, UCLA has also made their app available um, from their Center for Mindfulness um, Stress Reduction. And then their app is really good too, the, out of UCLA. You can just download it, it's free. Um, we're doing some work with arts and uh, social emotional learning with educators and then arts and mindfulness and doing some drawing and painting and working with clay and doing some movement. And it's, 
it's it makes a huge difference you know at first people are a little resistant and then they're like oh this is just what i needed and it really opens up conversation so it's sort of fun awesome and yeah thank you alicia for popping the link in there for that ucla program awesome. um and john i i appreciate your I, comment I saw a different... yeah I saw a different one the other day. I thought it was kind of exciting. The executive director of an organization said that he would personally put up $25,000 as a match for fundraising within one week. Very cool. That's what the executive, I forget what he doing, 25,000 of his own money to raise money. Regina, do you have 25K That's pretty personally cool. lying around for that? Mm -hmm. we, oh uh, yeah, let me let me just write no, a check. I, I just <laughs> got my it got my attention very quickly. My son yeah. doesn't want to go to college. It'd be fine with him. <laughs> um, but the other thing that John it. brought up is this idea of yeah. trusting, right? Um, and it, it's such a, a pivot, right, to think about how we manage people and our time and our own mental health and all of this stuff is asking us to think differently and challenge things and uh, I, I just want to encourage you all to be kind to yourselves because uh, this is a lot there's a lot going on um, and um, Neil I think um, I think or Marcel I guess we got your name wrong on the uh, but uh, some of the the economic development corporation of LA County is trying to um, keep a, a list a running list of where you can access locally sourced PPE. Mm -hmm. and, um, you might be able to put yourself on their list. Um, it's not vetted. It's not. They're not endorsing, but I know they're trying to make it easier for people to find some of that. And we know procurement's been an issue. So, yes. so wait, where is this information? And that, if you want to email me or just. We'll, privately talk, but I just for sure. all of you, I just wanted you to know that the LA Economic Development Corporation on their site um, is trying to keep a running list of where you might be able to get the equipment. And I know that LA County is trying to figure out, and I know the state of California is trying to figure out how to procure uh, some of this equipment in, uh, from safe sources and for a reasonable price. So right. you know, all of these topics are bubbling for sure. Um, right. So the more you guys can keep calling out where you're bumping into these issues that are getting in the way of you serving the community and your mission. You know, we talked in our group also about what this has all meant for advocacy groups and activists and, you know, how hard it is to connect with all the other things going on. So, um, you know, the reason why we want to do these lunch and learns and the reason why we want to keep doing all these webinars is to make sure that we can share what's going on that we're hearing and what you're hearing. And, you know, between all of us, we can figure some of this out. Um, or at least if we don't know the answer, we can refer you to people that do. So really glad that we had this time together. Um, Aaron, I don't know if you're ready to wrap it up, but I know um, we've asked people to stay longer than we planned. So. Yeah, thank you all for staying on to the end here. Really appreciate it. Um, we'll be sharing around the video. Um, we'll be sharing around the results of our sector snapshot in a way that you can access them and share them more widely. But um, if you haven't had lunch, I think now is the time. I'm going to go grab a bite. I um, hope everyone's week winds down nicely and have a safe and healthy weekend. And hopefully we'll see you back in two weeks um, for our next Lunch and Learn, which will be the first Friday in September. Um, and we'll be sure to send you a note when that happens. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.